talk again, um, just to really put in context why and how we read um, primary articles. And I know that uh, Anna May uh, probably gave you a similar talk. Hi, Kingman. Um, so you'll get two of our perspectives on how to approach papers. And I think this will be you know, important, obviously, in your career moving forward. Um, but also, I think we probably will be resurrecting um, a project we started years ago called Journal Watch with the uh, pulmonary and sleep fellows across UH and Metro um, with reviewing current articles and um, topical relevant articles that are coming up monthly. So, and most of you know me, but I'm Vidya Krishnan. I've been faculty at Metro Health for almost 13 years now. Uh, I did my training, my residency at University of Chicago and my fellowship at Johns Hopkins before I came here. Um, and medical school in Michigan. So I'm a big University of Michigan fan. Go blue. <clears throat> okay. Whoa. <laughs> Somebody's listening. Yay. <laughs> um, so, okay. Let me see if I can advance slides. Okay. So obviously, why to read a paper? Why are we doing this? You know, uh, journals keep us current. Uh, they're coming out on, you know, with the, the latest, greatest information that we have. Um, it really trains our critical thinking process um, and uh, hones our ability to uh, critically evaluate literature. And it also helps us for our own research and writing purposes. Um, what kinds of papers to read, you know, um, you know, review articles are great. They've been vetted by um, uh, knowledgeable people in the field, but really looking at original research uh, is what I want to focus on here. Uh, reviews, opinions, editorials are interesting in coming up with uh, you know, ideas uh, about how to approach a paper and how to uh, move a topic forward. And clearly peer reviewed and published in um, high quality journals um, is, is a factor, uh, but not the only factor. You guys are probably familiar with this pyramid of uh, just the quality of evidence uh, that we can look at. At the very base is just background information, expert opinion. Um, you know, going up, we have unfiltered information and in primary literature like case series, case controlled studies, cohort studies, um, randomized control trials. Uh, we consider the, the highest level of unfiltered data. And then filtered information is once we uh, sift through all of the knowledge that we have on a topic, we can look at critically appraised uh, individual articles, uh, synthesis of data, and then you know, sort of a pinnacle is really systematic reviews and meta-analyses where we have a formal analysis of groupings of articles on a similar topic. So what I want to focus on here in this talk is really sort of the base of this pyramid um, and why to, why to look at those primary articles um, and how it contributes to our fund of knowledge. And, you know, this is pretty informal, so feel free to um, unmute yourself and you want to ask a question too. I don't think I have the chat open to see uh, if anybody's writing. Okay, so the objectives here, like I said, describe different clinical study designs. Um, we'll stop along the way and with each study design sort of highlight an epidemiologic or biostatistical concept that's associated with that type of study design. Describe the pros and cons of each study design and uh, would love to hear your uh, experience in either conducting or reading these kind of articles and what you've met. And hopefully you have some questions along the way. So there's many ways to describe 
different study designs. We can look at them as observational um, versus interventional. You can look at retrospective designs versus prospective, uh, qualitative versus quantitative observations. Uh, have a single cross-sectional point of time versus longitudinal observations, which give us uh, some compass on uh, incidents and time and rates. Primary versus secondary data analyses. So, uh, first, yeah, expert opinion. Uh, not really much else to say except, uh, you know, I think this has been sort of highlighted in this whole COVID pandemic, listening to experts at the beginning. Um, you know, they have reliable experience that we can look at, but it's not necessarily the best uh, information. Best information, it's not always accurate. It's the best guess without uh, data. It's been relied on in the past. Um, it gives us a bouncing point on, on how to head in a direction, I think. But with time, data, and experience, we want to sort of uh, systematically look at patients' uh, information. And that's how we got case reports and studies, which you guys are all familiar with, I'm sure. It's an in-depth investigation of an individual or an event. It's descriptive and explanatory. Um, because it's a single case, it uh, really is working on or synthesizing all of the data that is available on a given patient, whether you think it might even be uh, relevant or not to actually uh, form a cohesive story. It can be hypothesis generating or testing. Um, I don't know, I just threw this in because I like the history of, uh, of research in general, but um, the history of case studies actually came, uh, like we're finding out many things in medicine, came from the business world. Um, in 1829, it was actually introduced as a social science looking at family budgets. Um, but eventually Harvard Business School adopted case studies for business situations and uh, created a textbook out of it. And that's what medicine has modeled as well. Um, so some misunderstandings of case studies. Um, I think they can add a lot to the literature. So some misunderstanding might be that there's, it's that general theoretical knowledge is much more uh, valuable than a single concrete patient practical knowledge, um, which we know is untrue. One cannot generate, generalize on the basis of an individual case and therefore the case study cannot contribute to scientific development. Again, um, case studies can be how we have uh, hypothesis generation. The case study is most useful for generating hypotheses, whereas other methods are more suitable for hypothesis testing and theory building. Um, so you know, testing a hypothesis and uh, treatments really start with a single patient and observation. And the case study contains a bias towards verification, a tendency to confirm the researcher's preconceived notions. Um, you know, um, so many uh, findings in medicine have been found ser serendipitously. You know, things like uh, digoxin for arrhythmias was really found um, by you know, observations initially. And it's often difficult to summarize and develop general propositions and theories on the basis of a specific case study. But like I said, case studies is really uh, sort of the foundation of how uh, we approach research. So a great resource, if you haven't found it already, um, for case studies is you go to the ATS um, SRN assembly, the Sleep and Respiratory Neurobiology Assembly. Um, they have a section on sleep fragments that has been co a collection of case studies over the years that uh, many of your faculty have uh, written case 
studies here. It's a great place to publish them. If you find a case study that you want to uh, have peer reviewed and published as well, and it's a great repository when you're studying for sleep boards um, to look at uh, different case reports. Okay. I think the next level of uh, evidence then is case series. When you have multiple patients of a similar exposure, disease, or treatment, you can start uh, uh, co collecting their data together. It can be retrospective or prospective. Usually it's retrospective. Um, so usually smaller numbers of patients than case control or RCTs. Uh, you really don't have a power calculation that you're working on to determine the number patients and often you're just limited by the number of patients you have available. Um, they should be consecutive. Um, if they're non-consecutive patients, there should be a reason why you're picking and choosing um, patients if they have a similar exposure. Um, and because it, you're not comparing it to uh, a standard group, then they're collecting these patients and observing them, it's, it is subject to confounding and selection bias. Um, and obviously you can't interpret any sort of causality. And that brings me to the concept of bias and precision. So if you're collecting you know, a group of patients that you want to study, and you have no basis of how they um, compare to the general patient population, if you're looking just at your study population and then your uh, study subjects, it can be subject to bias and precision. So I'm gonna ask you have an idea of what bias versus precision means. Or ask one of the new fellows. Hey guys, everybody's got bias, <laughs> right? The bias was we got sleep fellows into this conference. I don't know how precise we were though, <laughs> right? Well, yeah. <laughs> uh, so you don't you don't have uh, context of this outside of what I'm telling you. So, so the precision is really up to me and King Minutes keeping me in line. Well, I'm I, answering the question. I'm, I'm, I'm filling a void here. Come on, guys. I know. I want it to be interactive. Like it makes me feel like a fellow. Everybody's muted. Right. Okay, I'm going to pick on people. So, Omar, do you want to start? To, what, what's your idea of bias and precision? I, I can start that. Uh, oh no, I just figured out the mute button. Uh, bias would be uh, um, is making decision according. Well, I mean, you have an impact from the the. I guess the conductor knows or is is leaning towards certain outcome, and that's how bias would be occurring. Uh, precision is getting the information or the outcome consistent no matter what the result is. Excellent. Yeah, I, that's great. I think, you know, we're talking about the, the truth in general, um, you know, which is what we're seeking to, to find. And bias is how, is how far you are away from, from the truth, from the center. And that's what these targets represent. <clears throat> so if you have a large bias but high precision, and precision, like you said, is reproducibility of it too. So if you have a large bias but high precision, the numbers from a study may look very accurate, or they may look very true, but it's far away from the, the real truth. Right? Whereas if you have um, low bias and high precision, that gives you the best amount of accuracy. You can have the a representation of the real truth. Um, so what, 
we're looking to conduct studies that minimize bias and have high precision. Um, the real in, you know, pulmonary literature, the uh, real triumph of observational studies was this uh, observational study by the British researcher Richard Dole and his colleagues in 1954 uh, was one of the first observations that lung cancer has a potential association with tobacco use. Okay. But in sleep, you know, I'm talking about a uh, well-known uh, cohort study that you will be um, become very in, um, familiar with these findings of this study. The Wisconsin Sleep Cohort Study um, was um, started by uh, Terry Weaver and her colleagues in Wisconsin. It was established to determine um, the burden of sleep disorder breathing in the general public. And so what they did initially, their first step was to select uh, a weighted sample, we can talk about what that means, of Wisconsin state employees in 1989. Um, they selected employees who, uh, preferentially, they were looking for people who had snoring or witnessed apneas at a higher likelihood of uh, having sleep apnea, but um, also had patients who were not reporting those symptoms. And so in the first step, they wanted to look at the presence of sleep apnea and sleep symptoms among this group of patients that they um, had identified. So that's an example of what type of study. What study design did I just um, describe? Anupam, did you wanna? Observational. It is observational, because we're not doing any intervention on these. We're just observing. Um, but in a single point of time, they just looked at this group of, uh, Clearly defined patients, Wisconsin state employee, a population of Wisconsin state employees, and looked at their prevalence of sleep apnea diagnosis and whether they had sleep symptoms. The study design that I'm describing is a cross sectional study. Right? So it's sort of you know, you clearly defined a population, and in a single point of time, you want to describe them. It's an observation of all of the study population that you describe. Um, it can, actually I'll take a step back. It's an observation of all of the study subjects that you identify. If you're familiar with the terms, the study subjects are the subjects that are in a particular research project. The study population is what you are selecting from for subjects in your study. Ideally, you want your study subjects to represent the study population in general. Right? If you don't, that's when bias occurs, when it doesn't really truly represent the, the full population. And you want that study population to sort of represent the patient population overall. Um, in cross-sectional studies, you can describe absolute risks. So, risk of having sleep apnea in this population, the risk of being diagnosed with sleep apnea in this population that you've defined, um, and not just odds ratios, which we'll talk about in other contexts. Uh, you can determine prevalence, but because it's a single point in time, you have no, um, no information about time and how things evolve over time. So this brings up the concept of incidence versus prevalence. So in cross-sectional studies, you can determine the prevalence of like the percentage of people with a disease occurring at a single point in time. That's simply a percentage. Whereas incidence is the rate of developing a new disease within a certain time period. So it's a number of people who have developed the disease over um, the time duration. Some of the advantages of cross-sectional studies is that it uh, 
easy, low cost, very time efficient um, kind of study to do. You'll assess prevalence. You can compare risks of two different groups, patients who are obese versus non-obese, for example. Um, the downside is that it relies on routinely collected data. Um, uh, and so you may have run the risk of missing data. And because it is just a single snapshot, you can have this bias of ecological fallacy in aggregate data. And so this is sort of an interesting concept of ecological fallacy is, is a single snapshot really describing uh, what you're actually, the phenomenon that you're actually seeing, looking for. So think about this fallacy that there's two groups of students who take an exam, group A and group B. And there's, uh, so in group A, 80% of the students got uh, a mark of 40 on their test and 20% got a mark of 95. So the mean, if you just calculate the absolute mean, is 51. In group B, half of the students got 45 on their exam, half of the students got 55. So their mean was at 50. So if you're just comparing the means between these two groups, they're pretty similar. Um, and you might come to the conclusion, these are relatively similar students in the two groups. However, uh, if you look at them individually, and if you pick one student from group A and one student from group B and compare them, there is a 80% chance that the student from group B has a better score than group A. And there's only a 20% chance that a student from group A did better than group B. Um, so if you look at it in an individual perspective, you come up with a, a very different conclusion about these two groups. And you might make the conclusion that group B did a better job on the test than group A. So what it's really describing is this concept of mean, medians, and modes. Right? And so the mean is just the uh, algebraic average of a particular observation. The median is the middle number in the observation. And the mode is the most common uh, finding within, within a group. So if you have a data that's relatively standardly distributed, the mean, median, and mode should be relatively similar. When data is skewed to one side or the other, that's when you may have a significant difference in the mean and median. In general, um, after about 30 observations or so, the um, assumption is that your data is starting to look like the, the population data. Um, and you can make an assumption of normalcy of the data, but when your observation numbers are small is when you want to describe data in medians and instead of averages. So, uh, you know, the Wisconsin sleep cohort study then uh, went on to follow the subjects that they uh, recruited every four years, they would do an, uh, sleep tests and questionnaires uh, with these subjects. Over 100 papers um, have asked, so primary data has uh, come out of the Wisconsin Sleep Cohort Study. And one of them looked at the effect of weight change on the development of OSD. So what they, uh, you know, so for example, the study may have been conducted so that they looked at all the patients who did not have sleep apnea at baseline um, and looked at their change in weight over time and then their development of sleep apnea at the end. So 
what kind of study design am I describing there? That one? Um, this is a prospective study. So this is prospective in the sense that you're, you've identified the, the group that you're looking at, and then now you're going to introduce this element of time and observe how things change over time. This would be an example of a, of a cohort, study, a prospective cohort study. So here, I like these little diagrams because it sort of um, explains what these different study design means. So in a prospective cohort, you clearly identify uh, a study population. You choose, you recruit patients uh, from that study population. You look at what their patient characteristics are, the exposures that they have, and this is you, the investigator. And going forward, you want to look to see if they develop disease or not. So in, this, in what I described, you would select the study population of Wisconsin employees, um, recruit a sample of them, identify which ones uh, are obese, which ones are non-obese at the start. <clears throat> An important aspect of forward studies is that you have to exclude the disease of interest at the beginning if you want to calculate incidence. So you have to take out all patients who have sleep apnea or possibly have a high risk of sleep apnea. Um, and then going forward, you look to see how many of them develop disease after a certain amount of time. There are also retrospective cohort studies where you can look at things backwards and say, okay, this is you, the investigator. You go back in time, find a group of um, a study population that you want to look at, identify the patients that you want to include, and then which, one of, which ones of them develop disease after uh, some period of time. Um, obviously, one of the problems of retrospective cohort studies is that you're reliant on um, already collected data. So again, there may be missing data, there may uh, not have collected the exposures of interest to you, um, but those are the, the weaknesses of retrospective studies. Right, so, so in cohort studies, you, cohort is a group of people who share a common feature within a defined period, like all the Wisconsin State employees in 1989, or all of your patients in sleep clinic. You can compare within the group um, people with and without um, other characteristics. But you want the, the, the disease of interest should not be included um, in the original cohort. There's some, you know, the Wisconsin Sleep Cohort is obviously a uh, uh, well-known cohort study. The Sleep Heart Health Study um, was a longitudinal study that looked at uh, interactions of sleep disordered breathing and cardiovascular outcomes. There were 6,441 men and women age 40 years and older enrolled between 1995 and 1998. Um, Cleveland and University Hospitals in particular was a uh, was a site of origination. Is that right, Kingman, for the Sleep Heart Health Study with Susan Redline? We were the, uh, the Sleep Reading Center. The Sleep Reading we Center. We were not a cohort, because that's one of the things CASE does not have as a cohort. That's one of our university issues here. It's expensive to keep a cohort going. And, uh, but so we this is where, uh, in, in fact, that's a little trick if you learn, if you get involved with these things, to be a reading center, because that's the pick and shovel for the, uh, for the study. Um, so Cleveland was really the heart of the Sleep Heart Health Study then. 
um, you know, some other famous cohort studies that you're probably aware of, or things like the Framingham Heart Study, the National Child Development Study, and the um, Nurses' Health Study. A lot of these are actually um, publicly available data as well, too. So you can actually, um, you know, if you find out the, the data that was collected in these cohort studies, um, you can submit an application even to the investigators saying, proposing an idea that you would want to study. Um, and if these were government sponsored cohort studies, um, they are, there are ways to actually obtain the de-identified data and actually perform analyses on, on these kind of data sets. If you're so interested. <clears throat> um, then cohort studies really give you the opportunity then to, to look at relative risk. Um, and so I thought I'd take this opportunity to remind you what relative risk versus odds ratios are. Um, so these are real numbers from a cohort of people who are on the Titanic. Um, alive versus dead, um, male or female is really the information that we have here. A total of 1,313 people. So when we talk about the risk, the risk of dying based by gender is really just how the prevalence, right? How many of the females died is 154 out of a total of 462. How many males died is 709 out of a total of 851. And then the relative risk or the risk ratio is the ratio of those two numbers. So in this example, the risk for females is about one third. The risk for males, about 83%. So the relative risk of men dying on the Titanic versus the females was 83% divided by 33, a 2.5 times probability. Um, and this is, you know, relative risk I think is intuitive. It's how we normally think of um, associations uh, when we're describing them, right? So, <clears throat> So in summary, for cohort studies, some of the um, pros for a cohort study, you can actually determine incidence and relative risk now. Yeah. Efficiency for studying a wide array of exposures as risk factors. It can strongly suggest causality because now you have um, a time element as well. So you would still need experimental studies. Um, and you can reduce recall bias, uh, in particular in prospective studies. The cons, like um, Dr. Stroll mentioned, it's incredibly expensive to maintain a cohort, a large cohort for any period of time. It's time intensive. There can be high attrition rates. People move, people drop out of the study. Um, and they're less efficient than case control studies for rarer outcomes. So then what is a case control study? If you go back to our fun little diagrams, there's you, the researcher with the magnifying glass. Here, what you're doing is identifying the disease, people who have the disease of interest. <coughs> like I said, it's, uh, it's helpful when you're looking at a rare disease. So if you want to study in particular, uh, children, you know, elementary school kids who have narcolepsy with catalepsy. It's a pretty small uh, population. They really don't manifest that early usually. And you want to compare them to a control group. And then you go back in time and see what their exposures were that may have contributed to developing the disease of interest. Right. So then if you're thinking about risk ratios, comparing it to odds ratios, I'm going to take the same numbers that were on the Titanic here and now think about it as a, a separate study of patients with OSA versus not OSA 
and uh, looking at the association of obesity at, a, at an earlier time. Right? So if you take the exact same numbers, 33% right, of the non-obese patients in this study developed OSA, 83% of the obese patients developed OSA. Um, but in a case control study, now you've selected patients who have OSA and you've selected patients who do not have OSA. So if you think about it, these totals don't make a lot of sense because these two are coming from different populations. So now the odds of something happening um, is the ratio between the two columns. So the odds of a non-obese patient having sleep apnea is 154 divided by 308. So about 50%, uh, so about 0.5. So it's a two to one odds of not dying, uh, not having OSA, sorry, not dying. Uh, the odds for an obese patient having OSA would be 709 divided by 142, so about five. And the odds ratio would be the ratio of these two odds, so five divided by 0 0.5, about 10 times the odds of having OSA. So you know, two ways of calculating um, the association between your exposure and your disease of interest, the relative risk and the odds ratio with the exact same numbers, the relative risk would be 2.5 in this case, the odds ratio is 10. Um, odds is not normally how I think of associations when I'm sort of working out um, what the meaning of it is. So why is there a difference between odds ratios and relative risks? They're both ratios, um, but the relative risk, like I said, is how we usually think of risk. If you consider a change in mortality from 10% to 90%, that would be a relative risk of nine, but an odds ratio of 81. In case control studies, you can only predict the risk in one direction. You've already identified your, your patients with disease and without disease, so you can't really look at um, the risk by exposure because the populations you're looking at are uh, not necessarily from the same group. I think this illustrates that relationship between the relative risk and odds ratio well is that at sort of low numbers, the relative risk and the odds ratio are pretty similar. So in rare diseases, when uh, the prevalences are low, well, when, when the association, the relative risk uh, is pretty similar to the odds ratio. As you get higher with a stronger association, the relative, the odds ratio is much higher than the relative risk. Um, so odds ratios you have to calculate from case control studies, relative risks you can calculate from cohort studies. So it always, um, you know, when I'm reviewing articles, it's always interesting to me when there's a cohort study being presented and they'll present the data as odds ratios. It just makes the association look so much stronger, so much better. Make me wonder why they're not giving the relative risk, which is how logically we think of these associations. So the odds ratio, like I said, will always exaggerate the effect of the relative risk. If the odds um, for a relative risk uh, that's less than one, the odds ratio will be much less. And the opposite is true. Um, in case control studies, odds ratio is a reasonable estimate of relative risk as long as the outcome is rare. Um, the odds ratio interpretation depends on how you recruit patients. So I guess in summary there, case control studies are very good when you have a rare outcome because it's really an efficient way of studying that disease of interest. It's relatively inexpensive, it takes less manpower. Um, 
and it's hypothesis generating as well. Um, and it avoids um, ecological fallacy of observational cohort studies because you're really looking at data at an individual level. The cons of it is that you can't establish causality. Um, and it's usually a retrospective design, so you're subject to recall bias if you miss the data. Except, of course, the unusual case of the nested case control study, which is basically a combination of the cohort and the case control, where you identified a case, you identify the cohort, um, and then you go back and want to study something else. So maybe in the Wisconsin sleep cohort study that already looked at uh, patients who are obese versus non-obese and their disease of interest was obstructive sleep apnea. Maybe the investigator went back and said, now I want to look at obesity hypoventilation syndrome as the disease of interest, and then go back and look at the exposures that led to obesity hypoventilation syndrome. Um, so it's just a, a, another way of repurposing data from a cohort study inexpensive, you already have the data, um, but the control population may not represent the, the true controls that you want because of um, attrition rates. So one thing that, um, that case control studies um, does to uh, increase the efficiency of the study is that you can match between the case and the controls. So matching means you control the, you have a similar characteristic between the cases and controls that is not your interest um, for the outcome, that are not of interest to the outcome. So if you already know that gender is strongly associated with sleep apnea, you may want to match your cases and controls on gender so that the two populations are similar, but you won't be able to make any um, conclusions on how gender impacts them because you artificially uh, created equal groups. Once you match for a characteristic, you can no longer study the association. Um, and there's different ways of, of matching by ratios as well. I guess that's pretty much um, my coverage of the base of the pyramid here and why not to avoid the, the primary data. Randomized controlled trials, I feel like, um, you know, when we're looking at studies, I think we've all been exposed to um, randomized controlled trials and the strength of actually uh, having an intervention and seeing what, what the outcome of that intervention may be. One type of uh, study design that is not in this pyramid that is controversial <laughs> is, uh, is really where does big data research uh, fit into all of this too. Now that we have access to um, large data sets that are, you know, explain the complete universe of our patients. So if I want to look at everybody in the Metro Health um, system, I can get that information through EPIC. And so I'm no longer uh, making assumptions about this population because I have full data sets available. I can actually tell you exactly what is happening with the patient population of Metro Health patients in that sense. Um, there's uh, different differing opinions about the strength of the big data and how it um, fits into the strength of evidence. So that's the why to read a paper. And then how to read a paper is, uh, you know, I'm curious to see what, what your approach is. Um, my general approach when I have a new paper is actually, is obviously first looking at the title and seeing if it interests me at all. Um, I'm not too big on like, cutesy pun type titles, um, but it has to be an, an area of interest, obviously. I'll read the abstract and see if
any or all of those grab, uh, grab my attention, then I'll go on to read the paper um, with the introduction, results, and discussion. Don't get bogged down on the methods section. If you're not trained in the biostatistics, then um, I do sort of rely on the reviewers who reviewed the paper to say that the, the biostatistics is sound. But what I really want to look at is do the results make sense to me? Um, what are the limitations of the study? Um, if I really like it, I'll go back and read the methods section. And then obviously the last thing to consider really um, is always, is this going to change my practice? Do I need more information before I change my practice or is this sufficient to actually change how I approach patients? And usually it's, I need more data. <laughs> but yeah, go ahead. Anupam, you were going to say something? No, I just lost uh, sound for a minute. So I was um, just asking if everybody did. So okay. that's okay, thank you. Um, yeah, so um, tell me about, what do you think about that approach to reading a paper? Madhuri. Sure. Um, so I usually follow the title and abstract um, and then the results so far before I attended this? Yeah, I mean. Um, um, this kind of um, <coughs> give like a brief sense of, you know, what we are looking at and then what we want and then uh, methods, what they used in the research and then what the conclusion about. Um, yeah, I, I guess. Exactly. I think the point um, that I really want to make is it, you know, it really it completely depends on your background too and your comfort level with the the analysis portion of it, uh, your experience, and with reading more papers, you'll have more experience. Um, but you know, I run the the journal club for the medicine residents here, and it's very common to get bogged down in the details of the method section. And sometimes that's a barrier to really looking at um, the merits of primary research. Sure. Kingman, did you have anything else to add? Um, you know, I, I, I think, uh, let me, uh, Oh, sorry. Oh, I don't know. Something's going on here. Here we are. There we are. So, so from my point of view, I I look at a lot of uh, I, I sort of skim a lot of papers, and I do the I, I look at the abstract. I look at the title, see if I'm interested. Look at the abstract, and then figure out uh, and go right to the figures. You do what I do. <laughs> I, I just go right to the figures, and then the, if if you really kind of uh, if they write it correctly, from my point of view, in the introduction, the last paragraph gives you the hypothesis and the premise and what's new, and the first paragraph of the discussion says whether or not that premise was correct or not, and I'm almost more interested in whether it's incorrect. So I look for things that I don't know. Am I being heard? Yes. Okay. Please by me. Because my computer thing just somehow my, one of my screens just went out. And I'm trying to figure out where you are. <laughs> All right. Anything else? Um, I have a quick question. Yeah. Good. Um, Dr. Kirsten, thanks for the talk. I um, you know. For those of us who are, you know, trying to get into reading these papers and trying to get a better understanding of kind of these method sections, I hear what you're saying about not getting too bogged down, but do you have a good reference for, you know, if you really have some time and want to, you know, have a better understanding of, you know, exactly what type of study you're looking at or, or what, you know, their analysis might 
might be, I mean, do you have good references that you turn to? Um, yeah, you know, um, the Annals of Internal Medicine had this great series uh, years back on uh, how to approach how to approach a paper, basically. Critical appraisal of RCTs, critical appraisals of cohort studies, um, and sort of goes through each one. So with the residents, what I do is I give them that framework um, and a list of like 10 criteria that you're looking for to see is this um, you know, is the study done well? So if this was a case control study, did they clearly identify, uh, define who their cases are? Did they clearly uh, pick their controls from the same population that they picked the cases from? Are the two groups similar except for the disease of interest? Um, and if not, why not? Where are the biases there? Um, and so just going through that checklist to see what the strength of the study is. Um, I think that's a good first place to start. Yeah, perfect. Thank you. I can, yeah, I can see if I can find you a couple of those references. That would be great. Sounds good. I Anything hope else? this is a good foundation. Like I said, um, be on the lookout, and uh, I'll have to talk to Anna May, and uh, we'll we'll uh, resurrect Journal Watch. All right. See if we can apply some of this. So the uh, we're going to continue on this uh, Zoom call for the next hour for the first IQ for the fellows. I just sent the uh, case, which they shouldn't look at yet. It's hard, but they shouldn't look at it. And the. Um, it's a case that was done last March, so people who have had it, uh, who, who did it last March, uh, could be interested in just seeing how it goes. But I really want the four new fellows to, to really pay the most attention to uh, this thing. Okay, I'm going to take my leave then.